my pelvis is going to alternate as I walk. If I take a step forward with my left leg, then my right leg is going to be in more internal rotation. If I take a step forward with my right leg, it switches. The right side goes into more external rotation, left side goes into more internal rotation. The rib cage is no different. Look at this image right here of gait. It's essentially just alternating movement. As one side goes into one thing, the opposite side does the other. So really what the point is, is we want a rib cage that can move. How many power lifters, how many people do we see that do tons of back squats, tons of deadlifts, tons of bench press, and they're all locked up. They kind of waddle around. These people don't have a dynamic rib cage, which is ultimately the goal that we're going for here. So why does the rib cage matter? Well, for a lot of the reasons I just stated, but it matters for athleticism as well. It matters for the ability to dissociate our pelvis from our rib cage. We're gonna really struggle to do that if we don't have the ability to expand and compress our rib cage. We're gonna really struggle to do that if we only do things in the weight room that promote stiffness in our body. That's why I think it's really important to have unilateral movement. And even when we're not in athletics, we still need the ability to alternate and reciprocate. Athleticism is still human movement. Human movement does not change whether it's on a field, a court, or you're reaching up for the cookie jar. We still need the ability to alternate and reciprocate our movement. So if we do care about athletics in here, if we have some strength coaches in here, we still really want to have an ability to rotate our trunk there's a lot of anti-core training out there. There's a lot of anti-lateral flexion, anti-rotation, anti-extension training out there. But what that's doing is that's creating a stiff rib cage if we're only doing that. There's nothing wrong with those exercises. But if we're only doing those exercises and we're only doing things that promote stiffness, then we're not going to be able to get in positions like Lamar Jackson is right here. We're not going to have the ability to dissociate our trunk from our pelvis which is naturally alternating reciprocating movement. A couple of studies I wanted to cite here for you guys. Superior athletic performance was associated with decreased trunk control, which basically means that the more fluid the rib cage was, the more it could move, the better these people could get in and out of cuts and change direction. Faster athletes demonstrated greater pelvic rotation in their newly intended direction of travel. They're gonna have a really hard time rotating their pelvis if they can't associate it from their rib cage. They're gonna have a really hard time moving their pelvis in general if the rib cage doesn't move. These things are directly connected to one another. You cannot separate the rib cage from the pelvis. We're gonna be talking a lot about the rib cage, but if you guys wanna know more about the pelvis, look at my uh, webinar, Gait Tra Weight Room Training is Gait Training Volume 2. That's on my YouTube. That goes into a lot more about the pelvis. Let's get into some biomechanics now. So now we know why it's important, but how is it important? So the rib cage biomechanics can be summarized by just breaking it down into two separate parts. So our upper ribs are pump handle ribs. These, this is our rib cage, like one through seven, but the top rib doesn't really move much and that's gonna matter more later. So if you imagine a pump going forward and back, that's essentially what's going on with our upper ribs. Our lower ribs, once we get into more of the infrasternal ribs, these are more of a bucket handle. This is going to increase in lateral diameter when we inhale. This is going to swing outward and it's going to swing inward. So that matters for when we start talking about which areas are going to be restricted and why. So just think upper, more pump handle, more increasing in anterior to posterior expansion, and bucket handle is more transverse lateral expansion. So I like to break things down into two, kind of three chambers within the rib cage. To keep things simple, I just want you guys to associate the upper rib cage, the front and the back with T2 through T4. You can visualize that on that image right there. We're not really talking about the first vertebrae and rib because it doesn't really move a whole lot. So we're really concerned about T2 through four. So when I say upper and you'll see it all the time, that's what I'm talking about. The muscles that cross this area are primarily the mid and upper traps, the rhomboids, and the upper parts of the serratus anterior. That's more on the lateral rib cage. The lower is T5 through 7. 
Again, this is in the level of the scapula, and this is only a couple of vertebrae, but this is still what I consider the lower rib cage, because you'll see why I say that when we get into the testing. And then below that, that's going to be the, below the level of the scap. That's about T8 and below. And on the front side, that's going to be more associated with our infrasternal rib area. So that is going to be still a player in restrictions within our rib cage. But when I say upper, it's T2 through four, lower T5 through seven. On the anterior side, it's no different. Upper is still T2 through four. This is going to be associated with a little bit more of the manubrium. So our sternum has, has two different parts. The top up here is the manubrium. Down here is more of the sternum and you have your xiphoid process down here. So upper T2 through four, the fibers of the pec minor and also the upper fibers of the pec major are going to cross this area. Below, that's gonna be more of the lower fibers of the pec major. There's definitely more muscles involved with this, but I just wanna keep this really simple for you guys so that there's not a whole lot of confusion going on. We're just basically picking on the muscles most people know. Below that, we're gonna have the infrasternal angle. So let's get into the biomechanics of scapulohumeral rhythm. Let me grab my scap model really quick. So when we start off from zero to 60 degrees of flexion, that's from about here to here, our scapula is going to be in relative amounts of internal rotation. If you're having a hard time visualizing that, look at what's happening on that image right there. So as our scap goes here, which is internal rotation, our humerus is going to go into relative amounts of external rotation and turn out like this as we begin the process of upward rotation like so. So because the angle of the reach is pretty low here, the scapular external rotator muscles are going to be more eccentrically oriented, meaning our low traps, our mid traps, and our serratus anterior aren't really going to be firing. Not going to be, they're not going to be very tight at this point. So we're going to have a greater posterior expansion capability from about T7 to T12. That's going to matter when we start choosing exercise selection and reaches, degrees of reaches. Once we get into the 60 to 120 range, this is going to be more scapular external rotation and humeral internal rotation. I just want to drive home the point. That this is all relative. So when we go from a degree of scapular internal rotation and humeral external rotation, as we get higher and higher, the humerus is going to roll into more internal rotation as the scapula continues to upwardly rotate, but it's in relative amounts of external rotation. So we're going to now have those scapular external rotation muscles become more concentrically oriented, meaning that we're going to have a harder time getting air posteriorly and laterally because the scaps are upwardly rotating, because we have more lateral compression through the serratus anterior, and because those rhomboids and other uh, scapular external rotation muscles are becoming more concentrically oriented. So you might look at someone who's doing a reach straight ahead like this, and you might go, oh wow, they're opening up their mid back, but really they're getting more air anteriorly because of the role of these scapular external rotation muscles. So that's gonna be important consideration when we start choosing exercises. And finally, from 120 to about 180, again, this is a general range, we're going to have more scapular internal rotation relatively, which leads to more humeral external rotation. So we're gonna be here, and then let's say we're at 120, humerus is internally rotated, we're going to start needing to externally rotate. And then the big kicker here, is the scapula actually is going to posteriorly rotate and orient to allow for that to happen. So you go from this state right here, let's say you're here, here, you're gonna tip back as you get further up. And with that, you're gonna see the humerus going to external rotation like this. So in order to do that, you need to eccentrically or allow lengthening of the pecs and lats. If you see those power lifters I was mentioning earlier, they're gonna have a really hard time getting their arm overhead without arching their back because their pecs and lats are so tight and concentrically oriented. So in order to get to this area, we need to probably think about how do we inhibit those muscles. This is going to allow, if we're reaching in 120 to 180, more air to go into the upper parts of the thorax. That's that T2 to T4 area. To summarize, 
if we want a given area of expansion, we need to have a certain degree of reach. So generally speaking, from about zero to 60, we're gonna get more posterior lower because of the eccentric orientation of the muscles that externally rotate the scapula. That's going to be about that T5 to T7 and also below the level of the scapula. As we move into the 60 to 120 range, this is mostly maximized at I'd say about a 90 degree reach. We're going to have a lot of air going anteriorly in the T5 to T7 range, but you will still get some going into the posterior lower as well. It's not like everything's going forward. We're just getting most of it going forward. And then at about 120 and higher, we're going to get more anterior and posterior upper expansion in that T2 to T4 area. So now we're gonna get into the, a couple intricacies here and I'm gonna leave out a lot of the nitty gritty details because I want you guys to take away just some key points and leave feeling like you understand things. So the influence of movement is going to be important here. When I walk or when I rotate my trunk, my spine moves, right? It rotates laterally like this. So let's say I'm going to rotate my trunk to the left. Then my spine is going to turn to the right. Imagine those little bony protrusions, your spinal processes that poke out from your spine. Those are going to turn to the right, which is going to then close off my right posterior more relative to my left posterior, which is going to allow me to get more right anterior expansion because my right is closed off and more left posterior because my left is more open due to the orientation of my spine. So that's gonna matter if you wanna drive air into one area more than the other on a respective side. We can also consider the influence of pronation and supination. I think this is best visualized on the pelvic model right here, or the pelvic, the arm model right here. So if I were to pronate my hand, my hand were to go inward like this, I turn my hand in, that's going to internally rotate my humerus, right? And then that's going to allow for relative amounts of scapular external rotation. So what that's going to do is allow for anterior expansion. With supination, it's the opposite. So if I turn my hand outward like that here, I'm going to get more internal rotation of the scapula, which is going to allow for more opening of the scaps, which is gonna give me more posterior expansion. Okay, now let's talk about assessments. So now we kind of understand the basic side of things. Now, how do we tell where there's a restriction? The first test we wanna talk about is internal rotation. So what this is assessing is anterior lower expansion. This is testing for those pump handle ribs. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to keep our posterior shoulder on the ground. I like to put my other hand right there just to make sure that I'm not pushing my shoulder forward, which you'll see in a second. And we're looking for about 70 degrees. Some people look for 90 degrees and I can honestly like that right there. That would be a compensation. Some people look for 90 degrees on this, but honestly, I find getting that extra 20 degrees isn't really worth the effort and you can move on to other things because 70 degrees, you're generally not gonna have any issues at that point. The reason why this is assessing anterior lower expansion is because of the orientation of the muscles. So we have rotator cuff fibers that run posteriorly near our scaps. So if you were to draw a line down here in internal rotation, they would line up with the fibers in the rotator cuff that would be restricting the movement of our arm and humerus into internal rotation. I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty of that right now, but just understand there's an underlying reason. And also we can't move our humerus into internal rotation if our ribs are down and unable to expand there because we're already in and biased towards internal rotation. So we can't really try to get somewhere if we're already there. The other one would be humeral external rotation. This one you should be able to get 90 degrees on. So it's the same exact setup and you should be able to get all the way back. Again, the shoulder might come off the ground. We don't want that to happen. That would be a compensation. Also back arching would be a compensation. Something like that would be a compensation. So this is testing for T5 to T7 just posteriorly. 
And this is going to be an important test for coupling and seeing where the restriction is posteriorly with shoulder flexion as well. Abduction is assessing the ability to expand T5 to T7 anteriorly and posteriorly. So you can use this to cross-reference and make sure you can check your work to know where that restriction is. It's good to have more than one test. So what we're doing here is we're just laying off the side of something and we're just going to keep our hand parallel with the ceiling and we're going to drop it. You should get about 30 degrees here. If you see them start to rotate their hand inwards like this, then you know they're trying to compensate and it's easier to get more range of motion that way. Humeral adduction is assessing upper portions of our rib cage, both anteriorly and posteriorly. So this is again, we have musculature that if it's too concentrally oriented, it's going to basically restrict the ability for us to go into adduction. But also if we have depressed ribs, we're not going to be able to get there. Now this test is a little bit funky. It looks very simple, but it's also, it's also very important to execute it well because people can do that and roll their trunk to get more adduction. That would be cheating. So what I cue people to do is keep that little bone in the back of your shoulder on the ground. That is going to allow for a more genuine test. We want about 30 degrees on this as well. And finally, the big boy, humeral flexion. So remember the flexion arc we just talked about, 0 to 60, 120 to 180, and 0 to 60, 60 to 120, 120 to 180. So this test is very important to execute in a very specific manner. I can just raise my hand, my arm overhead like this and look at how much range of motion I get. Or I can test it more genuinely through something like this, keeping my back against something and my hand on my ribs to make sure I'm not arching my back and keeping my elbow straight ahead. The second you see that elbow start to deviate outwards, you know that the test is over, just like that right there. Because what they're doing is they're trying to cheat into abduction to get more range of motion. So I like to have them do this test, pointing their elbows straight at me, and I'll have them pause there and turn to the side. Then we know where that limitation is because depending on where they stop, you're going to know, or at least have an indication where they're restricted. If they get less than 90 degrees or 90 degrees, you know that they have compression in the lower rib cage below the scaps. And the reason for that is, imagine that I arch my back really hard right now. That's as high as I can get because I have compression here, probably anterior pelvic tilt, which is compressing me below the level of my scapula and not allowing that upward rotation to happen in the first place. From 90 to 120, you know that you probably have a compression at T5 to T7. This is going to be mostly posteriorly, but it's going to be also a little bit of anterior because we still need to expand our anterior rib cage to allow for optimal mechanics to happen on the posterior side. So if they get stuck here, that's an indication where the restriction is. And then after about 120, you know that they have a compression in the uppermost parts of their rib cage. This is going to be that T2 to T4 area. Again, mostly posteriorly, but a little bit of anterior. You would just take this and cross-reference with other tests to know for sure where it is. Okay, so let's say we understand the biomechanics. We understand where the restriction is. Now let's talk about actual exercise selection. We're going to talk about a couple ground-based things first, and then we're going to get into more dynamic weight room movements. So the number one thing we want is the stack. If we don't have this, we don't have anything. We need to be able to get our pelvic diaphragm and thoracic, thoracic diaphragm to basically stack on top of each other. Therefore, the name stack. So what that allows for is proper expansion upon inhalation and compression upon exhalation. This basically just means when we inhale, we should have circumferential expansion. We should have the ability for our rib cage to expand 360 degrees. And our pelvis should also open like this to allow for the pelvic floor to drop upon inhalation. That happens in a good stack. But if we're pushed forward, like in the picture on the left, then that's not going to happen as easily. We're not going to be able to ascend and descend respectively 
upon inhalation and exhalation. A really good initial movement is something like the rock back lat stretch right here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is a fantastic movement. And this is going to be the beginning of me explaining how gravity influences things. So imagine gravity pushing down on me right now. Where is the air going to go? Air is a gas and it follows the path of least resistance. So because gravity is pushing down, I'm going to get more air going anteriorly here. Relatively, I'm still going to get some going posteriorly, but because the angle of my reach, 120 degrees, I'm going to also be getting more upper rib cage expansion. So if you want to get anterior upper rib cage expansion, this is the move. And this is also a great exercise to inhibit a very restricted lat that might be limiting the upper portions of shoulder flexion above about 100, 120 degrees. This is another great exercise, more so aimed at the pelvis, but I like this because this is also great for a low reach. So notice how I'm reaching not in really any shoulder flexion at all, definitely less than 60 degrees here. And because gravity is acting down on me, again, more posterior expansion. I'm getting my hamstrings on to tuck my hips to allow for no rib flare, but also to bring my pelvis back out of that anterior pelvic tilt orientation. And this is just quadruped breathing. So for this, I'm getting a 90 degree reach. Ideally, I'm keeping my pecs off. That's why I slightly unlock my elbows. And then I'm just going to breathe in this position right here. Most people, when you do this, they, they round their back so much. It looks like, you know, the cat camel exercise. We do not want to do that here. Why? Because we would be depressing the sternum. We would be downing the pump handle and doing this right here. This is not what we want. We want a nice, even neutral spine and we want the ability to expand that pump handle. That's the whole point of this exercise. So if we're just going into the cat cow, we're not getting what we want out of this. So here's an example of how this stuff works. Do you guys hear that? Yeah, I can feel like my shoulder blades like messed up just a little bit. Yeah. Okay. 90 degrees of shoulder flexion. Okay. Care about that, Ryan. We want to see this in proof. Oh, uh, this one's definitely better. Do you remember how stuck you were? Yeah, it was like here. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's awesome. You know what we did? All we did was the rock back lat stretch. And we got both of those things. This is all we did, one set of five breaths. This stuff works. You just gotta know what the restriction is and what you wanna get out of it. Oops. Okay, so crawls are another great ground-based activity that can give us some expansion that we're looking for. This exercise. Inchworm crawls are fantastic because look at how gravity would be acting down on me in this position right here. Because I'm flipped inverted, I'm going to have gravity push down and give me relatively more amounts of upper rib cage expansion. A bear crawl would just be like that quadruped position. You would be getting a lot of anterior expansion. And then finally, crab walks. This is just a crab walk hold, but you guys get the idea. This is going to bring my shoulder blades together, right? So I'm not gonna be getting a whole lot of expansion between my shoulder blades. I'm gonna be getting it a lot below the level of the scap. So this is a great position also to get some hamstrings and hip extension, but also drive that expansion posteriorly because again, think about gravity. Gravity is a huge player that most people don't consider as much as they should. Getting our hip. Carries are another great activity that aren't super demanding a lot of the times, but they're going to drive expansion in the areas that we want. A suitcase carry like right here is going to be great for getting relatively more amounts of anterior expansion. You want to keep the bell away from you. You don't want to just have it hugging your side. And then you want to make sure that the other arm swings. A front rack position is going to give us relatively more amounts of posterior expansion. 
So right here, you can do single arm, double arm, it's up to you. But I'm gonna be getting more posterior expansion due to the placement of the load. Let's talk about weight room stuff now. So I'm gonna make a couple of notes right, right here, right off the bat. When we load ourselves with any amount of load, we have to compress. That's just how our body works. We will be compressing ourselves when we load with basically any degree of weight. That's how we need to press or basically keep the weight, manage gravity. We have to compress tissues. It's just what tissues are we compressing? How much load before they compress too much? That's a question only you can answer because it's so individual depending on your client. I am never going to think about this stuff when it comes to tier one activities. And what I mean by that is like, let's say it's a leg day and we're doing like a front squat on the first exercise. I don't care about this. Why should I? We need to let our athletes and our clients lift. If we're thinking about this stuff too much, it starts to interfere with the adaptations we want to get. So just, I would encourage you, don't overthink about this stuff. Start to think about this stuff in the accessory blocks. Let them get after it in the beginning. Let them have their fun. If we make everything too biomechanical, it starts to get a little dull. And also I'm assuming these accessory exercises aren't excessively heavy because if we load too much, we're going to compress too much and then we're not going to get the expansion that we want in certain areas because we're compressing everything in order to lift the weight or lift our body. So just make sure that the load is appropriate. Unless you're seeking an adaptation, that requires you to compress. It's all about the context. And I'm also assuming on these things, you're inhaling through your nose on the eccentric, exhaling through your mouth on the concentric. Definitely should be breathing throughout these things. If we're holding our breath, that's a big problem. A good example to start off here is a good exercise for lower posterior expansion. Why is this lower posterior with a 90 degree reach? Gravity. And also because I am essentially just doing this row. So let's imagine right here, this position. I'm digging my heels down, I'm getting some hamstrings, and then I'm going to exhale and I'm gonna come up. Inhale, and I'm gonna come down. What am I doing here? I'm trying to keep my stack. If I lose my stack, I'm gonna be in trouble in terms of the expansion, maximizing the expansion I wanna get. So this is gonna help restore some humeral external rotation, some shoulder flexion, and a little bit of internal rotation due to, the, due to the degree of the reach. These things aren't always black and white. And that's what I'm trying to drive home here. It's not like this is always going to, a 90 degree reach is always going to improve anterior expansion. It depends on gravity. It depends on the position you're in. Another exercise right here would be a tall seated row with a 45 degree reach. I like this alternating action because we're getting alternating expansion and compression. But we're biasing lower here. You guys see how that would work? Keeping my stack, alternating action, exhaling as I pull, inhale. And on all these row variations and the pressing variations, I'm really making sure I reach with both. But we don't want to reach so much to the point where we're just slouching, right? We want to keep our stack. So make sure you reach. That's going to allow you to maximize the expansion in the areas that you want to get. So this is going to be great for restoring low levels of short, shoulder flexion as well as external rotation. Here's another pressing variation in single leg stance. If you want to know what single leg stance is, mid stance phase of gait, I talk a lot about that in my other webinar. But here I'm pressing and rotating, trying to keep my stack. I will say on this, if you guys ever try it, make sure you don't pull that too far back because you will lose your single leg stance if you're letting that cable come too far back. So this is going to be great for restoring external rotation, shoulder flexion, because it's about a 60 degree reach. You might also get some internal, assuming you're not, your pec's not compressing the crap out of your anterior rib cage. For lower anterior expansion, notice how I'm in this relatively kind of prone position, right? Where gravity is acting down on me. This is just a basic one arm supported row. How many times have we seen this exercise? A ton. So what this is gonna allow us to do is basically imagine that quadruped position. It's not that different. You're now just using a load, assuming my, my there we go, now it behaves. Assuming we're keeping our stack, 
You guys see how that would work? And then let's look at this again. Let's break this down a little further. So here in this position, I have my trunk rotated a little bit because I'm reaching down with my right arm more than I am my left. So my spine is going to the right. So I'm gonna get again, more compression on my right posterior and I'm gonna get more expansion on my right anterior due to the position of my spine. Just things to think about. A chest supported row is also another really good alternative because gravity and also because you don't have to really think about keeping your stack. You're going to do it anyway. Just make sure that they're not excessively arching their back. I like to put some heel reference in sometimes, not really necessary, but you could do it. And then you're just rowing at it. This is a really fun row. I love this row. This is single leg stance. So I'm feeling some adductor. I'm feeling some glute med and I'm just rowing away. I'm getting after it. You can load this up and this is great for getting some anterior expansion, alternating action. I find people really like this one. You guys starting to get the theme here, starting to get the idea. Let's talk about upper expansion now. So upper expansion is going to be, again, that 120 to 180 kind of reach. But a lot of people are going to really struggle to get upper degrees of expansion when they don't lack shoulder flexion, right? So this is appropriate only when they have a degree of shoulder flexion that is basically uh, matches the context of what we're trying to do here. So would I do a 180 degree reach overhead or press into this wall if someone only had 120 degrees of shoulder flexion? Probably not. What I would probably do is reach them at 120 degrees. Challenge them, but make sure we're not having them compensate. So as you can see here, this is a staggered stance wall supported row. In this position right here, pause it right there. Get rid of this, this thing right here. This position right here is going to be biasing expansion of, let's drop the weight right there, my right anterior and also my left upper rib cage, more so anterior because of gravity. But also we're going to be getting some restoration of a deduction on the high arm, internal rotation on the low arm. Again, can you keep your stack? Can you keep your abs working? And can you not shrug your shoulders when you reach overhead? A landmine press is a fantastic variation for exactly what we're trying to get. A lot of people like to do military presses, barbell overhead presses. And I would argue that most human beings are not ready to do that exercise as soon as they do. This is a really good variation to teach some expansion while getting a stack. And also a little note on this exercise, when I do some sort of landmine press like this, I like to cue bilateral reach at first because people have a really hard time getting those ribs to come back when they just reach one arm. This I find is a lot more conducive to getting the sense of the rib cage and the stack. I like to keep a med ball in between the legs at first to make sure that the rotation is coming through my obliques and it's coming through my upper back rather than my pelvis because we wanna have alternating expansion and compression. You can adjust how close you are to the bar. You can adjust how you do this exercise based on the degree of shoulder flexion you wanna get. Sometimes I'll take someone up to a split stance position in this. And what that does is decreases the level of shoulder flexion necessary. You could do a, a seated press variation, which increases the degree of shoulder flexion needed. But again, it's like depending on are you closer, are you further? It just depends also on the individual's limb lengths. So this is going to help improve a deduction and higher degrees of shoulder flexion if we're trying to get into the 160 plus range. And this activity right here is fantastic for restoring a deduction, as you guys will actually see in a couple of minutes here, and also higher degrees of shoulder flexion. I like to do a short seated position because that actually allows my pelvis to open up. Let me visualize that for you guys. So when we're in high degrees of hip flexion, it's very similar to high degrees of shoulder flexion. It's an external rotation bias. So what we're doing is rocking back, opening up our pelvis into external rotation. 
which is going to allow us in this instance to get posterior expansion. If we were in an anterior tilt, that would be really hard. So when we do seated positions like this, what I'm cueing is a feeling of the sit bones. Those are those bony protrusions in each butt cheek. That's your ischial tuberosity, both of these guys right here. If you can feel those while you do an activity like this, or even just when you're seated during work, that's an indication that your pelvis is in a pretty good state. If you can't feel your sit bones when you sit, then that's generally not the best thing. It's just a little posture tip for you right there. This is another variation. I love this because it's inverted, right? Just the opposite way of an inchworm crawl would be. So here I'm digging my heels down into that bench so I can get my hip extension. This is a big bang for your buck activity. It's kind of a pain in the ass to set it up, but this is a great bang for your buck activity. So here, gravity is going to be acting down on me. And despite the fact that my reach isn't that high, think about the influence of gravity. Gravity is pushing down on me. So I'm going to get relatively more amounts of humeral adduction here. But again, I'm doing a bench press. Is it really going to restore that much? Well, it depends on the load. If you want to make it more corrective in nature, I'm not the biggest fan of that word, but I think you guys kind of understand what I mean by that. You could make it less weight and more of an active reach. And that applies to a lot of these exercises. So you can also adjust the degree and the height of the box, which is going to allow you to then sense more or less hamstrings. If people have less hip extension, you probably need a higher box or else they're going to start to arch their low back too much. And then you're going to lose your stack. Finally, right here, we've got an alternating triceps extension and hip extension. I'm a big fan of bang for your buck activities. I'm a big fan of things that restore an anterior pelvic tilt like a lot of people have. Again, there's nothing wrong with extension, but the question is, can we get in and out of it? That is variability. So here we're gonna be starting about 90-ish degrees. Notice how it comes back. So I'm increasing my level of shoulder flexion as I go back, and that's going to allow me to restore some of that adduction and a little bit of shoulder flexion and internal rotation on the arm that is not active because I'm actively reaching throughout this whole activity. It's also important on these things because gravity is acting down. It's really easy for people to shrug their shoulders on all this stuff. So I'm not necessarily cueing shoulders back and down and squeeze your scaps. What I'm cueing is just relax your shoulders. That's all it takes. So how much effect can these really have? Well, this is an example of me doing it really quickly. Assuming my internet will behave. This was my adduction, which I'm usually pretty stiff. And then I just did this exercise that we just talked about. Did about 12 reps, retest, boom. Again, it depends on the load. Look at how much weight I'm using on that stack. That's not a ton. So this is really best served in the accessory block of things. Like I said earlier, I'm not gonna be thinking about breathing in a front squat, a bench press, things like that. We gotta grip it and rip it at the beginning. Here's another example. We did some, it's not shown in this video here, but we did some banded rows. So let's listen to this. And when I rotated this one back when it's on the ground, like sharp discomfort through there as it rotated till about right here. And then that's nice. And how was that? Was that any better? Any less, okay. any less painful? Yeah. Good. And then he was good. Just one set of five band and rows. Is it, is it gonna be that easy for everyone? No, it's not. I don't want you guys to think you're gonna work magic on everyone. Some people need more or less help and more frequency. Some people need more input to change their output. What factors it depends on is primarily age and genetics. I find the younger someone is, the more pliable their body is. They can make these changes crazy quick. But if they have had decades of living in a certain pattern, decades of compensation, it's going to be harder to see this rapid change. But it does happen. It just takes a longer time because their body is so comfortable in their compressed state. 
So you might be asking what order or is there an order we should do these in? There is. How do I progress these? How do we progress these to get the expansion we want in other areas? How do we know when and why we should progress things? What about the lower body? And what about asymmetry? There's probably a lot of PRI influence people in here. How does that play into this? Because it definitely does. Well, today I'm reopening my early bird pricing for you guys. This is a webinar exclusive thing. So if you're here right now, or if you watch it today on YouTube, you are welcome to take advantage of this. I'll be sending out an email to everyone that registered to sign up for that. You basically just have to pay early bird pricing. It's 125 a month and there's 12 weekly presentations. We're gonna get into a lot of stuff. And this is the foundation. These principles are just the beginning. There's an optional weekly review session where if you're confused and this stuff seems really complicated to you, I'm gonna be there for you. I'm going to allow you to have as much opportunity for asking me questions, asking other people in the Slack chat questions. There should never be a moment where you feel like you're not getting help. So this is really geared around you guys learning these principles and learning to apply them effectively. But I'm still gonna give you programs and examples. I'm still gonna allow you to just take everything from this program and just, you could copy and paste it at the beginning, but I want you to understand that it takes reps to understand how to do these things. It takes trial and error. It's not easy at first, but this stuff is going to make a huge difference for yourself and your clients if you really get in the rabbit hole a little bit. And it doesn't have to be overly complicated. If you guys want to know what we're going to talk about over the next 12 weeks, the first week we talk about biomechanical respiration strategies. We get into individual differences a little bit. Then we're going to get into the pelvis and then the thorax and how asymmetry plays into that. Then we're gonna get into a much deeper assessment process than the one I showed you today. We're gonna to talk about compensatory patterns, what happens when people start to deviate from what's initially expected, and then weight room exercise selection. That's gonna go way deeper than what this did. Week seven, we're gonna talk about core, and new to this, this is the third time I did the group program, new to this is going to be plyos and speed. We're gonna get into some sprinting stuff. Week eight is one of my favorite weeks, is energy system development, this stuff, these individual differences, we can actually sort of predict and we can have a general framework for understanding how the biomechanical side of things and the anatomical side of things, the respiration side of things influences our energy system development. Week nine is all about programming. Week 10 and 11 are case studies. I see that people don't really get the most out of it unless there's two weeks of case studies. So for the first week, what I do is I, pre I present case studies to you guys and I explain everything I did, why I did it. And then week 11, I split you guys up into groups. You have a case study for yourself and then you present it in front of the group. You have one person from your group explain it in front of everyone and they're all different. So there's some variety. And then week 12, we get into some business and marketing and also some psychology stuff and motor learning at the end and tie it all together. So if you guys are interested, I'll be sending out that email right after this. And that's all I had for you here. So let's do some Q&A. If you guys have any questions at all, please throw it in. Let's see. We got one. Hey, Connor, thanks for hosting this webinar. Would you be able to explain the rotation of the thorax versus spine during gait? And also, would the pelvis be following the motion of the rib cage? So I don't think one follows the other necessarily. I think they're just both tied together for eternity because you have the spine, which directly connects to the rib cage. And so let's say we're taking a step forward with our left leg. So when that happens and you strike the ground with your left heel, you are basically going to, you can visualize this, or I'll visualize it for you guys. When I strike around my left heel, I'm going to have a rotation of my trunk to the left side. So if you guys imagine that image I had back here, I'll reshare my screen with you. This image, this pretty much explains, I think what you're asking. Um, so the rib cage is going to go into relative amounts of left posterior right anterior due to those finest processes moving. So if you want to bias one side more than the other, think about which arm is gonna be reaching further ahead than the other. Uh, thanks for getting this together. 
how to minimize pecs during pushing exercises? That's a really good question. And I don't want you guys to think that pecs shouldn't be active during pushing exercises. They will be. And really what I find with the pushing exercises, it's gonna be better for posterior expansion activities. You will get some anterior if you want to reach. So what I mean by that is, imagine I have that cable row or cable push. You can get here then you can reach further. If you guys do that right now, try to reach your arms straight ahead, put your hand on your pec and notice how you can sort of give it to shut off. Unless you're really compressed, you're gonna have a hard time doing that. But just reach it forward, see how that pec shuts off a little bit. That's how you would get it. Would I do that on a barbell bench press? Absolutely not. But you could definitely get that pec to shut off a little bit. But think about what happens when your pec is on. You're gonna get more posterior expansion because the air's not going here. Uh, does this get posted on your YouTube? Yes, it will be posted on my YouTube. Broad implications for someone with a sway back, very flat thoracic spine. Yeah, so I think it depends where they started from. I get into this specific thing a lot in my course, but ultimately if someone has a very flat back, they probably have a counter nutated sacrum, meaning that they're here and their sacrum tips back. So you see how that would have a flat back, whereas I'm a presentation of the opposite. My sacrum is forward, which increases my spinal curves. So if someone has a sway back or a flat back, I know that they're probably going to be compressed anteriorly at first. And this is why. So if you're here, this is more external rotation bias. So those individuals usually have a compression here because in, and this is getting into the weeds a little bit, these individuals usually have a diaphragm that's very descended. If you guys know about the infrasternal angle, these are your narrow ISAs. It gets pulled together because they're trying to exhale. This gets compressed, their head gets pulled forward. So they can really only expand their scaps. Their scaps get pushed into a inhaled state, so, so to speak. Do you ever assess ER at zero degrees of abduction? Um, that's a good question. And I have in the past, I just find that the test, the assessment battery I just showed you guys right there, that pretty much tells me everything I need to know, but you very well could do that. That is an option that you have. When is the course going to start? November 1st is the first day. You guys have um, until the end of today to sign up for that pricing if you do want. Um, based on your experience, is there any reason why a client often strains the scalene unilaterally with overhead barbell press? Yeah. So I'm assuming you're doing the, this guy right here. So think about what's going on right there. So if you're pressing, what a lot of these people do, and this is often coached a lot, is you do this right here, right? You push your head through at the end. Your scalenes love to elevate your ribs and elevate your shoulders and pull your head forward. So that's probably what's going on. I would imagine that person doesn't have the shoulder flexion necessary, and they're probably pushing their head too far forward. But if you have a video and you want to send it to me, I'd love to take a look. Uh, how would this apply differently for an athlete that requires a lot of trunk stiffness for performance? Uh, well, then stiffen them up. That's what I would say. Uh, so when it comes to athletes, I usually have a, a given range that I want people to live in. So for example, uh, if I have a sprinter, they really need to be in an anterior pelvic tilt. If I got them out of that, and I got them into a neutral pelvis, I would probably be inhibiting their performance. So the same thing applies for uh, this hammer thrower. If they need to be stiff, I think we need to train them to be stiff, but have a degree of variability present to where it's not a red flag. So for example, if this individual uh, needs to gain stiffness, but his shoulder internal rotation is 10 degrees, that's a problem. But can he get his stiffness, and however you're measuring that, maybe it's his performance, and he can get to maybe about 40, then I'm probably not as concerned, but it, de it depends on the individual where they're starting from. Do they have an injury history? Things like that. Oh, and I'll also add to that, in the off season, I'm generally gonna try and get people back to more neutral in season. Why would we wanna take them out of what makes them successful? If there is unilateral compression of rib cage, does that also manifest in a static postural assessment of the feet? Will you see pronated feet when one side is extended? 
That's a great question. It really, it really does depend and what layer of compensation they're in. Uh, but I will say this, if they have an anterior pelvic tilt orientation, that biases the femurs into internal rotation like this. So what you often see is a pronated foot in that position. What you might see if the anterior pelvic tilt is too excessive is really limited shoulder flexion. What you also see on the opposite end of things is this presentation right here, this inhaled pelvis, which biases the femurs towards external rotation. And then you have more of a supinated foot in most cases. And then those individuals are the ones that have that anterior compression. The people that are like this, like me, have that posterior compression. Thanks for doing this. How might you alter that lat opener for a power lifter who might need a bit more anterior to posterior expansion? You could do some variation of that in a sideline position. Now, what you could do, you can get creative with it, right? It's just all about the principles. You can get them in a sideline position and you can have them turn and pull on something like a squat rack. That would be one way to do it. You could also really like ultimately because of that, the position and influence of gravity, they are getting anterior expansion. If you wanted to get more posterior expansion, just get them in a different position where gravity does that. How can this stuff help people with a counter nutated pelvis? Well, like I just said, the people with the counter nutated pelvis at first, I assume you mean sacrum like this. Those people have that flat back. They have more posterior expansion, anterior compression. That's why you see a lot of people with forward heads in this position. These are often people who are thinner and more female. The people that are here compressed in the pelvis and internally rotated, these are people, imagine a spectrum from this, like a thin marathon running female to a big wide powerlifting male. That's a spectrum and everyone lives on some end of the spectrum, but it is mostly in the middle for most people. In a large group setting, do you see accessory exercises as a broad use for large, large populations in limited loads? I'm not entirely sure what you mean by that, if you can clarify. Um, but if I, I think I might understand. So if I have a large group of people and I get into this again in, in, the, in the course, but I split people up into two different categories. Are they more compressed in certain criteria? And are, is the other group more compressed in certain criteria? So for example, if I have a group of 20 people and 10 of them are like this and 10 of them are like that, I'm gonna pick the same exercises, but just change the angle of the reaches, change the stance maybe, and change the constraints to get the outcome that I want. And then that way the flow isn't interrupted and that way they're not having to change equipment. They're just doing something different just slightly with the equipment and the reach. Um, cool insight. The rock back stretch created a large increase in range of motion in the example you provided. Is inhibiting the lat actually addressing the underlying issue, i.e. the fact that the lat is tight? Could inhibiting it then cause issues as the client may not be strong through that range of motion? Good question. So like chicken or the egg, I guess. Um, I would say that the lat in this instance is in an eccentric orientation due to the position of our humerus. And that is what's going to drive the expansion. The lat stretch is honestly a secondary consequence. So remember it's position driving function. Therefore the lat is being stretched due to the position that we're in. The lat stretch, I honestly don't really care about. The lat is stretching because of the expansion that we're getting. And then that's a secondary consequence. And then once they have that range of motion, we do want to train them through it. So if I can get them to own it, we're going to put them in a row or a press variation, like a landmine press or that short seated pull down, get them to own it. Thoughts on hanging to improve shoulder flexion. I like it a lot. I just don't think most people are ready for it at first. Um, again, the population I work with is just different than a lot of people, but I find with athletes, they can benefit from it a lot. People who are very stiff, general pop, tend to really struggle with it. And this is what I would recommend. If you have someone that has about 100 and probably over 120 degrees of shoulder flexion, they're probably gonna be able to hang okay. A single arm hang from a pull-up bar is even more intense, but it's also, I view sort of a progression. 
But if someone has very, very limited shoulder flexion, like let's say 90 degrees, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put them in a hang in just this position right here because gravity is going to act down on me. I'm going to get hamstrings, posterior tuck, expansion below the level of my scaps where that 90 degrees of shoulder flexion is an indication that I have compression there. And I'm going to have them breathe. And then I'm going to have them slowly with other exercises, increase their shoulder flexion until they can get to a nice overhead hang. But hangs, hangs are sweet. I like them. Is it possible to have limited hip internal rotation and not external rotation in anterior pelvic tilt? Yes, it is. And that would be a secondary consequence, uh, secondary com uh, compensation. So when you're here in this nutated sacrum, what you can do is you can have a secondary compensation where you concentrically orient this stuff back here. So you get this awkward sort of bending of the sacrum and you get this really compressed individual who's now compressed from the front and the back. And in that instance, you want to restore what they should have. So if I'm someone who should have internal rotation, I want to give myself that first, then fill in the gaps. How about strategies for lateral rib expansion? If you want to get air laterally into your rib cage, I would say have gravity act on you in a way that's going to expand you laterally. If I'm on my side, I'm getting lateral compression. Gravity's acting down on me to compress me from side to side. If I'm on my back, gravity's going to flatten me out like a pancake. I'm going to go here and then everything's going to kind of spread out. Another activity that I really like for lateral expansion that's pretty effective is, I'll just show you guys right now. Get on a couch or a BOSU ball, lean over it, boom. Just hang out there and breathe. I actually think I have a post on that um, on my Instagram page somewhere. I think it's the lat stretch post. Any other questions? These are great questions. I like this a lot. Well, while individualization is obviously very important, can you speak to any trends and limitations and, co and compensations you might see in different populations? Might make for an easy starting point. Yeah. So. If you've got, I just look at the person and just give them, give them like a very quick assessment. If you don't want to take them through everything, just do internal, external rotation, shoulder flexion. And that's going to give you a pretty basic idea of where you are. And understand if you have a group of people, it's hard to take them through a full assessment. I get into shorter assessments within my course, but when it comes to certain populations, I find the older someone gets, the more compressed they are because they're starting to lose the battle with gravity. So people hunch over as they get older because they become more and more compressed. So the younger someone is, generally I find they don't have issues and they're gonna clear up pretty quick. The older they are, it's gonna be a little bit harder. But I'll also, it's kind of a tangent, I'll also say this, someone's posture, someone's visual posture, let's say I have a hunchback posture and I'm 70 years old and I'm walking around like this. Is this ever gonna improve? I don't think so. I don't think you're ever going to get this person to look like this. It's going to get better, but they're never going to be able to fully stand upright because they're stuck there and they have been for so long. So I would say that if someone's young and has a weird postural abnormality visually, you can probably clear that up. The older someone gets, the harder it gets. Um, but when it comes to different populations, I think athletes tend to really um, thrive in anterior pelvic tilt. Uh, they tend to be very compressed and limited in internal rotation pretty much across the board. Uh, very few times do I see an athlete who has full IR because they have to compress. They're, when you're an athlete, you compress, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, but can you get in and out of it? That's the question. Um, what other considerations are there for a person who is hypermobile huh, but still has a compressed upper thoracic? Yeah, you do see that a lot. Uh, if you guys see wild, crazy uh, results in the lower body, like you might think they have laxity, so to speak, it's probably because they're starting from an anterior pelvic tilt orientation. The reason why anterior pelvic tilt happens so much is because people are trying to go forward. Like human beings are trying to survive, reproduce, and, and go forward. So if we're trying to go forward and we can't do that on our own, we're going to find a way to do it. That's the summary of it. 
So if we start in an anterior pelvic tilt position on the floor and we're doing like a straight leg raise, look at what happens. I'm already starting in hip flexion. What I'm probably gonna do is roll my pelvis back in order to get more range of motion. If I have really pretty much lax hamstrings, it's gonna be easy for me to get a crazy straight leg raise, but I'm not actually going into internal, internal rotation. That's kind of a tangent, but um, ultimately if someone's hypermobile but is still compressed up top, then they probably need to regain the ability to control their range of motion, get out of their likely anterior pelvic tilt down below, and they probably need to start with lower posterior expansion activities. How about a scoliotic client? Yeah, so if someone has scoliosis, that's, that would probably play into the asymmetry thing. Uh, I'm not a physical therapist, so I don't really you know, do that. But if I did have a physical therapist I was working with and I was cleared to pick some exercises for this person, think about trunk rotation, think about the influence of reaches and think about how you want to train that person. But also I would say, think about clearing people bilaterally. Most people have bilateral limitations. So we want to clear those before we get to the nitty gritty underlying asymmetrical stuff. What are some common restrictions you see amongst powerlifters and to what degree do you suggest fixing them in order to not hinder performance? Uh, they're really stiff. I think you guys have seen that. Uh, they're really, really stiff. They're going to be super limited in IR. They typically have full ER. And the reason for that is a secondary compensation. Um, they're usually, I'm talking about guys here, but girls are also usually probably the same thing. Limited IR, they're probably gonna be more limited in ER because of a secondary compensation, but guys usually just like me. I, I, I had a powerlifting phase, full ER, really limited IR, really limited shoulder flexion because they compress themselves so hard. Typically power lifters are those people that are doing barbell squats, bench, deadlift all the time. So they need that stiffness. I say it's like any other athlete. At what degree are we okay with them not passing the tests? And what degree do we want them to pass the test in season? So if they're really far away from a meet, they probably wanna pass them more. If they're coming up to a meet, probably a little bit less. So it just depends. Can they get in and out of things? I'm going, and it's gonna, be, it's gonna be variable. Someone who has a ton of injuries in the past, I probably want them to, let's say internal rotation, I probably want them to get to, you know, 60, 50 degrees or so. But if someone has pretty much no injuries, they're like LeBron, they don't really get hurt, then I'm probably going to allow them to get away with more. Um, let's see. That's all I got on questions. Anything else? These are great questions. If LeBron gets hurt now, if you need to do this. Why the hook line drill with the feet up? Uh, so the hook line position, let's go visualize that really quick. Uh, where was it? There it is. Okay. So you guys have seen 90-90 hip lifts before, right? 90-90 hip lift is 90 degrees of hip flexion and knee flexion. So what that's doing is it's the limb arc for the pelvis is really similar to the limb arc for the shoulder. When you're here, you're in internal rotation. That's bias, just like in here, internal rotation of the humerus. So when I'm in a 90-90 hip lift, I'm biasing IR. Due to the degree of my hip flexion in this position, I am biasing myself towards more ER and a counter nutated sig. So if I wanted to re restore nutation and IR compression, I would do more of a 90-90 hip lift when I'm talking about the pelvis. If I wanted more counter nutation and more external rotation bias with my pelvis, I would do a hook line hamstring bridge. And you could change the angle of the reach depending on the thoracic limitations. I will say though, doing supine based activities with a forward reach like this is really hard for some people who are compressed because what you're asking them to do is get anterior expansion in a position that's pushing down gravity and trying to get them to get posterior expansion. So I would say if someone's really having a hard time, that's not a position you wanna put them in. Sideline is probably a good spot to start. Anything else? Still got 41 people in here. You guys have any questions, throw it on me.
It could be related to anything. It doesn't have to relate to this. We could talk about who's going to win the football games tomorrow. Ninety-nine hip lift mutation. Yes. So it's relative, right? So it's going to be more like this in a 90 90 hip lift position because when you are in 90 degrees of hip flexion that is just like the Lamar model for the upper extremity that's going to be more internally rotated biased yes so i actually don't do the one-on-one -on -one consultations anymore i used to but i like the group program more i think it's just more engaging and it's better for the individual too simply because there's other people they can bounce ideas off of and uh, it just takes way more time. So I just prefer the, the biomechanics group. Any other questions? Anything at all? No person, I'm not sure what you mean by, oh, you mean like one-on-one -on -one trainings? Yeah, I don't really do them anymore, unfortunately but you can join the program. If you guys have any questions about a specific client, you're also welcome to ask that. What exercises would you recommend for a powerlifter to increase their IR? Basically, anything that I had on this right here, things like this. Powerlifters don't really like to lie on the ground and breathe a whole lot unless they're really broken because then they just don't have a choice. So things like this are gonna be ideal. And I would really cue a reach here, lightweight accessory blocks, stuff like this. Things that allow them to feel like they're doing things and they're not bored on the ground. But I find this actually restores a pretty good amount of IR as well. What you could do is you could just change the level of your humerus. You could just go to 90 degrees and still pull back a little bit. Boom, you got it. This is also gonna be effective for that. If you need something really, really simple, but if you want to restore IR and they're like totally immobile, get them in a sideline position. Just do a 90-90 hip lift, but flip them on their side and have them pull against something like a TV stand or like a, I don't know, squat rack, something like that. Hey, Connor, I'm already signed up. Have you picked a day time? Uh, I have not because I'm waiting for, we'll probably get a couple signups from here, waiting to get input from them and then we'll pick the date. But everything's recorded, so don't worry about it if you can't make it. Wouldn't you say shoulder IR is associated with ribcage depression, i.e. posterior expansion? I'm not sure what you mean by that, but when we do exhale, our ribs go into internal rotation, right? So that, I, I think what you're trying to say there, and correct me if I'm wrong, so if this comes down, we get more posterior expansion. I see where you're going with that, but shoulder internal rotation is measuring the ability to expand this area, because if I'm already pulled down, if I'm here and already internally rotated, when I go to then internally rotate, I'm going to be stuck because my humerus won't allow me to move any further into internal rotation because my ribs are down pulling this forward. Is the pelvis webinar on your YouTube? It is. Yes. How to inhibit neck scalenes during breathing exercises? Great question. I actually, <laughs> this rock back lat stretches, I've been talking about a lot today. So notice how in this rock back lat stretch, I am, this is actually some pretty good information. I didn't get into it with For this, this you want to rock back. but uh, when we do reach our humerus above about 120 degrees, what ends up happening is our cervical spine rotates to the same side. So we're going to have, it's kind of like this. This is what happens. So it's very slight, you don't really see it, but that is what's happening to a slight degree. So the reason why I'm turning my head to the left here while I stretch out my left lat is because I'm training eccentric orientation of the tissues on my left neck because the tissues on my right neck are generally the ones that help rotate my head to the left. So I'm eccentrically orienting the other ones on my left side which would turn my head to the right. Now, this position right here is really good for inhibiting a neck, assuming, assuming they're not shrugging into it like this. 
So what you could do, another example would be like an incline arm bar, get them on a bench, get them in an arm bar like this and just have them sit there on the incline bench, reach, turn the head to the same side. That could work really well too. And ultimately just anterior rib cage expansion is going to help them um, get those neck muscles to kick on because the neck muscles that do elevate the rib cage attach on the first two ribs, like the scalene, the SCM loves to pull up on the rib cage when we can't get air into it and we can't use our diaphragm. So to improve IR, we want anterior expansion. Yes. What type of core exercise do you recommend most from a performance standpoint? I think that's a really heavy context dependent question. Um, I think, yeah, that's really hard to answer. I just really like to train rotation. I like to train people to what they don't have. Um, so for example, if they're a baseball athlete and they're constantly rotating one way, I want to, I want to allow them to rotate the other way. So I might do like a, a single leg stance, pal off press, rotating the opposite direction of where they usually do, because that's going to help fill in some gaps. Um, based anti-extension drills are really good. Um, yeah, it's, I just, it's really hard to say without knowing more context. If one has weak adductors diagnosed with tendonitis, where would you start? Start getting the pelvis moving with isometrics for the adductors, or maybe even start with some breathing with focus on the obliques to help with the adductors. So I think it depends how we're defining weak adductors. So a muscle can be, it can be concentrically oriented, and then that would basically inhibit the ability for it to contract more and that could make it weak, or it could be essentially oriented, which would, you would have to then overcome that orientation and that would contribute to it being weak. Or it can just be a straight up weak muscle in a normal orientation that hasn't been trained yet. So I think it depends on what we're, what we're talking about here. So if we have someone who has weak AD doctors due to a length issue, what I would probably do is have them do drills to facilitate the ability for them to get IR because they're probably out like this. So we probably maybe do like a ball between the knees goblet squat to allow them to get some compression internal rotation within their pelvis and allow them to feel some adductors, which will allow them to then ascend the pelvic floor and get those adductors to work in an integrated fashion. If they had an adductor weakness due to a too tight concentrically oriented pelvis, what I would probably do is put a band around their knees in a goblet squat, because what that's going to do is that's going to bias me towards more external rotation. I'm not going to shove my knees super far outside my toes. Like you see a lot of people do at the gym. I want to keep my knees in line with my toes. So that's going to bias me towards more ER. And generally, I just think it's important to train, train the AD doctors eccentrically and concentrically. I get into that a lot more in the course, but Ultimately, um, you can do that in a, in a variety of different ways, like single leg stance activities, split squats, depending on the degree of hip flexion you're in. Depends on the limb arc model. Um, you could do isometric stuff too, like a sideline adduct or pullback, if you guys have any idea like what PRI does with that. Which part of the rib cage would you want to free up if you wanted to increase your arch in a barbell bench press? I would say probably your anterior because in order to get into a barbell bench press and increase your arch, you need to create a pressure gradient within your upper body to where everything is going forward. So you need to be able to expand this. If you're being pulled forward by really tight pecs and lats, and you're gonna have a hard time being able to expand this. I actually just posted a, a thread on Twitter yesterday uh, about pretty much exactly that, um, just in a little bit different context, so go check that out. Any other questions? Anything you want. Thank you, Greg. Yes, this will be on YouTube right after this. If TFL or iliacus or psoas is on one side, lying adductor pullback, what to do? You mean if you feel those muscles in the side lying adductor pullback, what to do? Uh, I think that's what you mean. So if you do feel your TFL 
in a adductor pullback. What I'm imagining is you're probably trying too hard to pull and you're probably not, I would bring your leg higher up on the uh, wall there. So let me just show you guys what that would be. This might be helpful information. So if I'm on my side right here, doing an adductor pullback, what a lot of people will do is they'll use maybe too big of an object and they can't really push down on it like a foam roller. Other people will start their legs too close here. So when they press down, they get TFL. What I recommend you do is you get this leg higher, use a smaller object, turn the toe down, and then you're going to get a ton of adductor because you're biasing the femur into internal rotation due to the position of the foot and then you can focus on it more. And also just trying less. Most people who feel TFL are trying really hard to push that leg down, but it's, it's supposed to be chill. It's just a, it's not a max effort strength exercise. So usually just backing things down helps. What is the model you've been mentioning? Uh, limb arc model, it's a Bill Hartman thing. Uh, I think he might, I don't know if he has a video on his YouTube about it, but I'm um, trying to think where you could learn more, but I know Pat Davidson has a power hour. That's where I, I learned about it for the first time, like a couple of years ago, I think. And he has something on his power hour where he goes into detail on it, but you have to pay for that. Uh, Bill might have something on his YouTube. Zach Couples might have something on his YouTube. So I'd go look at those things. Any final things, guys? Thank you guys for coming, by the way, and sticking around. So we got 29 people in here. Going once. Going twice. Okay, if you guys have any other questions, you can reach out to me on social media. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And thank you guys for coming today. I genuinely appreciate it. I hope you have a good rest of your day. See you later.